And one of the most useful pieces of advice that we talk about in the book is is a principle that some friends of mine came up with that says, anytime you have a presentation, anytime you have a, a PowerPoint deck or, or a memo that goes out, go through and circle all the numbers. And then search around the numbers that are circled for a phrase like, what this means is, or in other words, or a way of picturing this is. You know, so you look for those phrases that indicate somebody's about to translate something that's there into another form. And if you find a single number that you've circled that doesn't have a translation, that's a sign that you either need to get rid of that number or you need to translate it. And so your, your notion of looking for the meaning, I think, is a simple version of their test that's even more straightforward. That is Chip Heath. Chip is a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and New York Times best-selling author of Switch and Made to Stick. He has a new book out called Making Numbers Count, The Art and Science of Communicating Numbers. Today we are talking about his new book, Making Numbers Count. As Chip shares in today's conversation, humans are actually really bad when it comes to making sense of numbers. And today we're going to find out why that's the case. We also explore how to use numbers in a way that people will listen to what you're saying, what the curse of knowledge is, and Chip shares a few basic yet practical tips you can implement when you are communicating with numbers. We just talked about with rounding, but it could also mean that you have the curse of knowledge and that you look at the number and you understand what it means and you expect everyone else to do it and and that's where you're making the mistake. And so if you're using that phrase to say, we need to simplify our numbers, that's a good impulse. If you're using that phrase to say, we don't need to translate because everybody already understands our numbers, that's false. It's false on average and it's false in, in society because we get back to the millions and billions problem. It's like, without translation, those are just lots. The world is changing quickly. What do you need to know and do in order to be successful now and in the future? From leadership to the future of work to employee experience, this show will give you the insights and the tools you need to succeed and thrive professionally and personally. Make sure to follow me on Spotify or subscribe to the show on your favorite platform. You can do so easily by going to futureofworkpodcast.com. Also, please rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred platform is. It really helps spread the word about the show and I personally appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Future of Work podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Morgan, and today my guest is Chip Heath. He is a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and New York Times bestselling author of Switch and Made to Stick. And he has a new book out called Making Numbers Count, the art and science of communicating numbers. Chip, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. So as we were talking about uh, before I pushed the record button, I had your your brother on the show, I think it was last year, talking about uh, his latest book. So now, now I got the other brother on the show. Yeah, thanks for supporting the Heath family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm like your, your biggest evangelist now. Uh, so I'm really curious, why did you decide to write this book? So I've been frustrated for, for years in trying to teach the, about the earlier book that Dan and I wrote together, Made to Stick, because one of the one of the things that frustrated us at the time was we, we didn't have very good advice or very complete advice about how to how to deal with numbers. And so what we encourage people to do is to simplify your numbers. Don't use too many because they're confusing and abstract to people. People have a hard time di- grappling with numbers. And what I wanted to do was come up with some more specific advice. And so, so and, and really I was pushed into that by my students because one of my students at one point said, you look, look I'm an investment banker. I can't can't get away from numbers. How do, how do I deal with the ones that I have to talk about? And so I took that seriously and added some exercises to the class. And they, they came to be one of my favorite parts of the class. I just I'd set up a competition where people would try to take a, a, a number or statistic and translate it into a more usable form. And people came up with some brilliant things. Yeah. So did you find that this was like something you were struggling with as you were writing some of your previous books is how to, how to communicate your numbers and the data and information in a way that resonated with people? Yeah, definitely. We, we would come up with a, a particular translation for, for a statistic and, and we'd work at it until we got satisfied, but there, there weren't any general principles that we had at the time for doing that. And this, what this book is about is general principles for, for taking classes of numbers and making them more likely to 
be understood by people that are listening or more likely to motivate people that are listening. Hmm. Um, and why do you think this is important for us to be able to do? Well, it's important because we're really bad at numbers. And <laughs> let me give you a quick example of that. So billions and millions. We all know that a billion is bigger than a million. But how much bigger is it? So here's a thought experiment. If you counted from each second for, for up to a million, how long would you be counting? The answer is 12 days. If you counted each second up to a billion, how long would you be counting? The answer is 32 years. And mm -hmm. nobody gets that right. Not physicists, not mathematicians, not engineers, not mathematicians. You know, this, like, this is way bigger than we expected. And in fact, there's evidence in the, the psychology literature that we're really good to numbers up to numbers of like five. So we're really <laughs> solid on one, two, three, four, and five. And and you can see this if you've if you've ever been a parent and you read one of the kids' counting books to them. You turn the page and there are three goldfish on the page, and your brain immediately shouts three, and you don't have to count for those. But nobody ever had their brain shout nine when there were nine nine pumpkins, you know. And so it's called subitizing. And what subitizing says is that we're really good as humans at recognizing at a glance numbers up to about five. And after that, we're, we're in bad shape. Hmm. So my, uh, I guess my five-year-old daughter is going to be very, very glad to hear this. She's going to say, yeah, daddy, I, I only need to know how to count to five. Um, <laughs> well, well, in fact, in fact, most cultures that have ever existed in the world would only allow her to count to five because most cultures have had names for the numbers one, two, three, four, and five. But beyond that, it was always a generic term like lots. So it's one, two, three, four, five, lots. Hmm. And and we're more sophisticated in our culture, but, but essentially when we get to billions and millions, we're all saying, well, there are lots. And we don't have a good sense that billion lots is 32 years worth of lots yeah and a million lots is 12 days well uh, a billion certainly does sound like lots <laughs> um i want to take a a quick step back really quick uh, before we continue talking about your book and that's learning a little bit more about you and how you got involved with some of the work that you're doing how you got to be a professor why you turned to writing books can you share a little bit of your your background story and how um how your life led you to where you are now Sure. I grew up in Texas and went to Texas A&M as an undergrad. I was an industrial engineer. And then at some point I decided I wanted to not be an engineer for the rest of my life, but I wanted to teach. And so I looked at teaching high school and it turned out it would have taken me three years to get a teaching credential for high school. And I thought PhD in four years might be a good choice. And so I, I basically got a PhD at Stanford and was very involved in what, what has become behavioral economics. It's the psychology of decision-making applied to economic context. And I spent a long time looking at that and basically taught, taught in business schools for a number of years. And at a certain point, I got excited about ideas and how they transmit and whether the right ideas went out in the marketplace of ideas. And so I started doing research on urban legends and rumors and false, explicitly false ideas that survive and propagate very rapidly in the environment. And it, it started bugging me at one, it started bugging me that we're, we've got all these false ideas that are propagating effortlessly, and yet we can't get true and useful information about don't suntan or don't, don't pick up smoking habit as, to junior high school kids. How do we get true and useful information to have the properties of the, the things that circulate effortlessly? Hmm. And that's, uh, I suppose, what led to the, uh, the first book. Yeah, so that's a made to stick, and we talked about the properties of sticky ideas of all kinds. And then our second book was about change, because we found that a lot of the people that were coming to a book about sticky ideas were trying to make an idea stick about change. Yeah. And so we... Hmm. Um, okay, and I suppose that brings us to where we are uh, today, and it sounds like with each book that you've been writing, it seems like you're, you're tackling something that you're, that you're faced with in, in your life, like concepts, ideas, challenges as well, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we wrote, we wrote Switch because we had all, we had both tried to change at various points in time, and we were looking for the best hints that we could find from the literature on change and how do we resolve this conflict, this inner tension that we have between what we know we ought to be doing and what we really want to do. Yeah, which is, I think, something a lot of people struggle with. 
Um, and so with your current book on numbers, let's kind of jump back into that. And um, why is it you think we're so bad at numbers? Because some people listening to this might say, yeah, I'm a numbers person. I'm great at numbers. But collectively, it sounds like this is something we're not really good at. Yeah. And, and to the numbers person, I would say, you know, you've, you've invested a lot of effort in learning to speak a language. And that language is not a natural language because, you know, most cultures have existed without that, that language up to the, the present time. And we luckily we were born into a society and a culture and a set of world cultures that have grappled with numbers. But our brains still weren't tuned to those things. And so when somebody says, I'm a numbers person, what that means is they've invested a lot of time and effort learning to make those numbers work. And so what, what we need to do once we do the analysis that our training has led us to do, we want to be in a position where, where we're going to be able to translate that analysis. And there's, there's an entire set of skills about translation that nobody ever teaches us hmm. to go along with our analytical skills. Interesting. So when you say an entire skill of translation, you mean like uh, having having a number or, or information and, and making sense of it and telling a story behind it? Yeah. Let me give you the simplest possible example. This is this is a uh, an example that comes from a group at Bing that run the Bing search engine for Microsoft. And what they found is that people would be binging the system for for facts. So what is the land area of Pakistan? And it turns out it's 340,000 square, square miles. And what they started experimenting with doing is giving people a simple perspective phrase, a simple comparison to help put that number in perspective. And so they'd say, the area of Pakistan is 340,000 square miles. That's about the size of two Californias. Hmm. And what they found is that when they, when they gave comparison phrases, people were likely to remember things more in a day, in six weeks from now, they followed up with some people a month and a half later, and accuracy essentially doubled at all those time scales, and essentially doubled even if, if, even if the comparison phrase was a little clunky. So two California is this pretty vivid picture in people's minds, at least in the States. Five Oklahomas for U.S. residents is not quite as intuitive but five Oklahomas, you did better, about twice as good as people that without any comparison phrase at all. And so what translation means is that math is, a, math is a foreign language to us. And so we would never insert a random phrase or, or story in Japanese or German into an English translation, into an English speaking meeting in the United States without translating it. And yet very often we throw our numbers up on the graph or on the PowerPoint slide, and and we're not translating those numbers. And what, what the Bing experience says is that even simple attempts at translation go a long way. Yeah, and I suppose, and you have a lot of great examples in the book, which we can certainly uh, um, touch on in a few minutes. Uh, and I suppose this is an important topic because numbers is a part of our everyday life for how we communicate, for how we make decisions, for... Uh, for everything we do, both personally and professionally. And so if you can get your point across and tell a story with the, those numbers, it sounds like you are more likely to be able to drive change um, at work and, and at home and pretty much in anything that you're involved in. Yeah, and I think I think if you think about the change problem, is, is you've got to understand where you're going with the change and understand the need for change. And so there's a, there's a cognitive component about that, about just do I grasp the world correctly? And then there's a motivational component about that. It's like, do I want to do this? Do I think it's important? Do I think it's necessary? And what we've got in the book are tools that help help take con abstract numbers and first make them easier to understand and then also make them more motivational. Hmm. Um, so let's start off with the, maybe some common mistakes that uh, maybe leaders or that we in general make. Um, so when we're trying to communicate numbers and tell a story with data, because, you know, everybody loves data, right? Everybody loves information and numbers. Mm -hmm. We feel like we use it all the time to make a case. Um, you see it on TV all the time. It's it's in every aspect of, of life. Where do you see some of the big mistakes uh, for how people communicate using numbers and data? Well, let me, let me give you one. Um, it turns out our brains aren't very good with fractions percentages, and yet we're using those 
fractions and percentages a lot. Um, one of my favorite stories in the book is that former CEO of A&W Restaurants was recalling a time when A&W Restaurants were in competition with McDonald's. McDonald's had just come out with the Quarter Pounder, and it was making a big splash because it was the biggest burger that people had had in fast food restaurants. And so A&W Restaurants decided they would do it even better, and they came out with a Third Pound Burger at the same <laughs> price as the McDonald's Quarter Pounder. And did consumers rejoice at getting better value for their money? No, they actually complained that they were getting ripped off because a third pounder, in their mind, there was a three in that number, and a third pounder, three is smaller than four, and so A&W is asking them to pay the same price for the four quarter pounder as for the third quarter pounder. Interesting. And and so they, they got it exactly wrong from what we did, and yet... If we think about those fractions classes that we took back in elementary school, if, if those didn't stick with us to allow us to understand that a third pounder is actually a better deal than a quarter pounder for the same price, then what are we going to do when we, when we come to more complex fractions and percentages? Yeah, that's and so pretty funny. <laughs> let, me give you, let me give you one of my favorite examples in the book. This is by a master's student who, who took one of our, our workshops in, that we ran in preparing the book. And she started with the statistic that about 40% of Americans, and this is pre-COVID, but about 40% of Americans admitted that they sometimes didn't wash their hands after using the bathroom. And that sounds kind of gross, and 40% sounds kind of large, but here's another translation of that that's more concrete and doesn't involve the percentage. What that says is that two of the last five people you shook hands with didn't wash their hands after using the bathroom. Hmm. And all of a sudden, when I... When I've been in crowns and I've read those two side by side, the 40% versus the two out of five, there is a visceral response to the two out of five when people start reaching for the hand sanitizer immediately. <laughs> and, and that's just by taking an abstract percentage and turning it into a concrete example of that percentage. Mm. No, I, I love that. And I'm actually still surprised that uh, the quarter pounder and a third, third pound burger, the people didn't realize that the quarter pounder is actually smaller than the third pound burger. And it was a... Uh, it's, it's funny because it's not something that you would think about. And I can't imagine like the marketing executives at A&W when they were thinking about this, anybody brought that up. Like it's just, yeah. you don't think about that at all. So, so I guess that tells us, like you said, that we are notoriously bad with fractions and we need to simplify things whenever we can. Well, and it also speaks to, this is the big villain of communication that Dan and I found in working on our, our first book, Made to Stick, is it's something economists and behavioral psychologists call the curse of knowledge. And what the curse of knowledge says is that as we know something better and better, it gets harder and harder for us to picture somebody not knowing what we know. Oh. And so if you've ever been on the other side of a conversation with a doctor or a lawyer talking about medicine or the law, you've been on the other side of the curse of knowledge. Yeah. And that expert cannot, cannot imagine what, what you lack in your, your picture of the world. But it's not just fancy people with lots of degrees. It's ask an 11-year-old uh, that you know about, about his favorite video game, and you will be on the other side of the curse of knowledge. An 11-year-old cannot fathom the depths of your ignorance about that game. Hmm. And, and so as we, become, as we become numbers people through training and we do the right analysis, what... What we've done is curse ourselves with our knowledge. So it, it looks it looks very very obvious to us what, what we're trying to do. Yeah. And and it doesn't necessarily come across to other people. So how do you break that that curse of knowledge? Because I mean we probably all struggle with that. And uh, you know, there have been times where I've been frustrated as well, where I'm trying to communicate something that I feel I know very well and it's just not landing with people regardless of how many yeah. times I repeat it and keep saying it and communicating it. So how do you uh, tackle that? Yeah, it's one of the most frustrating things. And, and what we've got in the book are about 20 or 30 tools for, for doing that in various situations. But here's a meta tool for thinking about that, is if we can, if we can get, out of, get out of our understanding of the situation long enough to think about how to paint a concrete picture of that to somebody else, that's going to stand us in good stead in communicating that to somebody else. So, for example, one of the things that puzzled me for a while, uh, 
a few months back was there was a container ship called the Ever Given that had blocked the Suez Canal. Do you remember this? I do. Yes, yes, yes. Apparently, with world world shipping because there was a critical critical artery that, and I never I never understood the Suez Canal was quite as important as it as it is, but it wasn't clear to me in my mind how a ship a single ship could could back up a full shipping corridor and. And people talked about this ship being a quarter mile long, and I had vague knowledge of what a quarter mile is, but I still can cross that with the, the Suez Canal. And then finally somebody said, you know, the Ever Given is longer than the Empire State Building. If you take off that thin, tiny antenna that, that goes on the top of the Empire State Building. And so now I'm picturing the Empire State Building on its side, Going across the Suez Canal, and I can start to see, yeah, there might be there might be a problem there. <laughs> and so that notion of going for something concrete that's much more concrete than a mile long, or much more concrete than just saying there's a container ship stuck there, that moving from abstract to concrete by painting a picture is an important tool that should stand you in good stead anytime you've got an analysis. Yeah, no, I I, I love that. Um, well, let's talk about some of the other tools that, that we might be able to use. Um, so one of the things, for example, that I remember I was taught, and I can't remember if this was in college or, or where this was, uh, but to always try to tell a story with the data. Um, and, mm-hmm. and I suppose that's very related to, to some of the stuff that you're talking about. Um, so moving to this kind of concrete concept, I think makes a lot of sense. Are there any other, maybe some of your favorite tools uh, that you talk about in the book that uh, people should be implementing? Sure, yeah, and and I want to I want to lower the bar a little bit from from the people <laughs> that tell us to tell stories with our data because when I think of a story, I think of something with a plot and characters and it's yeah. complex and it unfolds over time. And turning the ever given into the Empire State Building is just a picture; it's not a story. And and I think that picture is is important in 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 most situations, and more than the story. But let me let me give you an example where there is a story. And it deals with one of the most simple numbers that you can imagine, it's seven years. And the reason this came up in our class was I had given my students an exercise to try to try to push carbon fluorescent bulbs when they first came out. So they were really expensive, but they were good for the environment. They used a quarter of the electricity, and, and they lasted a long time. And, and so I assigned my students to get across the notion that this saves... This only uses a quarter of the electricity of your standard bulb. And and so people set off to do that. And then I started having people report out what their group had come up with. And one group said, well, we ignored your assignment. <laughs> and they said, we ignored your assignment because using a quarter of the electricity is fundamentally an abstract notion. And we didn't even want to try to grapple with that. But here's a more concrete notion. People hate to change bulbs. And... This bulb says it's going to last for seven years. And so let's use that as the focus of the message as opposed to the electricity. And I thought, okay, you got me on my own, on my own turf. You know, I, I shouldn't have probably assigned you to, to do a quarter of the electricity when there was another <laughs> concrete thing to do. But what they did is they took seven years and made it even more concrete. They said, what this means is if you change the bulb now and your child is learning to walk, the next time you have to change the bulb, your child is going to be in second grade learning about gases and oxygen. And the next time, they're going to be learning to drive. And all of a sudden, seven years had meaning that I had no clue about just hmm. thinking about. It. And yeah. go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I, I really like the, the phrase that you said. And I'm wondering if this is um, something that we can think about. It's kind of asking yourself that question, what does this mean? Um, because I feel like oftentimes we're presented with data or we have data, but we forget to ask ourselves that question of what does this actually mean? Which I think even just those uh, those three words, what this means, can really help change the way that we actually use data and numbers to communicate information. Yeah, that's an excellent piece of advice. And one of the most useful pieces of advice that we talk about in the book is is a principle that some friends of mine came up with that says... Anytime you have a presentation, anytime you have a, a PowerPoint deck or a, or a memo that goes out, go through and circle all the numbers. And then search around the numbers that are circled for a phrase like, what this means is, or in other words, or a way of picturing this is. 
you know, so you look for those phrases that indicate somebody's about to translate something that's there into another form. And if you find a single number that you've circled that doesn't have a translation, that's a sign that you either need to get rid of that number or you need to translate it. Hmm. And so your, your notion of looking for the meaning, I think, is a, a simple version of their test that's even more straightforward. It's just like if you can't say what this means, then you're not, you're not doing your duty to your listeners. Does, uh, and I don't know if anybody's ever said this to you, but what if somebody comes back and says, well, if you don't know what it means, then it's probably too complicated. Like, uh, you know, I, I've heard people say that before. Like, if you have to explain it, it's too complicated. Or if I can't tell what this means just by looking at it, then it's too complicated. Is there uh, any truth or merit to that? I think there's certainly merit in that a lot of times the numbers that we use are too too difficult to understand. They're like we make a big case in the book for rounding numbers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just a single, a single number like 438,695, your brain has about seven plus or minus two slots of memory that you can use. And that number that I just quoted you uses up six of them. <laughs> and, and so the more you can do to simplify a number, so instead of 438,000, I forget my own number, uh, 365, you know, instead of those six digits, why not make it 400,000? And this is something engineers and physicists and doctors do all the time, is round up, they look for a ballpark figure, they look for a, a quick and dirty calculation. Because what they want to do is get in the ballpark of something that has magnitude that they understand and you can't do that when you're carrying around all these extra digits. Hmm. And so, so one of the first things that you want to do is, is simplify on that basis. But when people say, give me your phrase again. What, how did you phrase the critique? If it's Oh, if people um, say that if you have to explain it, um, then it's already too complicated. Or if I can't yeah. just look at the number and already know what it means, then it's, it's you know, too complicated already. Yeah, and I, I think that may be true. It may be a good sign to, to simplify the number that you're using, like we just talked about with rounding. But it could also mean that you have the curse of knowledge and that you look at the number and you understand what it means and you expect everyone else to do it. And, and that's where you're making the mistake. And yeah. so if you're using that phrase to say, we need to simplify our numbers, that's a good impulse. If you're using that phrase to say, we don't need to translate because everybody already understands our numbers, that's false. Hmm. It's false on average and it's false in in society because we get back to the millions and billions problem it's like yeah without translation those are just lots hey it's just a quick reminder to check out my brand new pdf thefutureemployee.com which looks at how employees are evolving and changing and what you as an organization need to do to evolve and adapt you'll get a complete breakdown of what that evolution looks like as well as action items that you should be taking. It's an invaluable resource and you can grab it at thefutureemployee.com. Again, that's thefutureemployee.com. And now back to the show. Well, it's funny because I know like in the world of marketing, you know, everybody always says, instead of saying $20, say 1999, or instead of saying it's on sale for $400, say 399, 99. And yeah. it's so it kind of goes like again, and I don't know if it goes against what you're saying or not, um, but it's certainly like you know you're adding two and in some cases three extra digits when instead of just saying twenty dollars you have to say nineteen ninety nine. So well, and I think I think there, there's a reason for that is they they want to fog your brain at that moment because they want you to think this is a bargain, and if they can keep your brain occupied by thinking of nines, then that's 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 even more impressive because what happens is. 1999 becomes 19 as opposed to 20. Yeah. You know, it's one cent away from 20. Yeah. Ah. yeah, it's funny. There's, uh, It's like all these little things, but there's so much um, subtlety in all of it, especially with numbers and how we convey information. It's, it's, it's a really interesting space. Uh, are there some other common mistakes that you find, uh, maybe especially in the workplace as far as how leaders communicate or even how individuals communicate when it comes to using numbers. I think we talked about uh, fractions. We talked about making things concrete, asking um, what does it mean? Uh, any other particular tools or resources that, that you encourage people to think about? Yeah, there's a whole other class of tools that we haven't talked about yet. And so making things concrete, making things simpler, um, those are all ways of getting people to understand the numbers. 
But there's this other sense in which we use numbers in in many situations where we, we want the number to motivate people to take an action. Yeah. And so so our fav- favorite example of this is Florence Nightingale went in and while well, she was creating nursing on the side as a field that exists today, she was she was a trailblazing statistician. Uh, she was a trailblazing statistician who basically she was part of a group that ended up with the mortality statistics that we quote all the time about people are more likely to die from from this kind of cancer than that kind of cancer or from stroke than from um, falling off a ladder. This kind of mortality statistics are have collected in large part because of Florence Nightingale's work with death certificates and getting people to standardize the way that they coded deaths and and so the data was available for people to look at later. But Florence Nightingale was trying to clean up medical practice in in the army and she did a calculation at one point that said that given the standards of care in army hospitals at the time there were 1100 deaths a year of the young men that had agreed to serve our country that shouldn't have happened because the hospitals in london down the street that were public hospitals were doing that much better at caring for their their patients and so our, our military hospitals are killing off 1100 soldiers a year because we're not up to standards on sanitation and, mm-hmm. and, and breast practices. And what she did with that 1100, that's shocking in and of itself, but she, she went further and she drew out more emotion. She said, that 1100 is worse than the bubonic plague, the Black Death. Mm. And she went into situations where she said, you know, look, here's, here's a situation where a, a, a ship sank and we lamented as a society that brave soldiers had died on that ship that sank. But there were three times the number of people that were killing in our hospitals every year as opposed to that ship. And in fact, we might as well line up 1,100 men and shoot them at the beginning of the year. And that would be kinder in some ways because then they wouldn't suffer from the sepsis that sits in and and wastes their body given our our sanitary standards. Mm. Now, those are brutal comparisons. But think about Florence Nightingale's position. She's, She's... not an upper class woman, she's a middle class woman, without formal medical credentials, without title, without resources. She didn't have an organization behind her backing her at that point. And she's talking to military generals and lords of the the realm and and politicians of all kinds. And she's gotta motivate people to make change. And so all those comparisons that we just talked about, the emotional comparisons, are taking a number that has some meaning because we understand 1,100 deaths is a significant number, but making it even more significant because it's like if we don't solve this problem, it's like we're shooting these 1,100 guys. Yeah. And, and in general, I think that's a good lesson for us is that numbers have – or good numbers have motivational capacity. Hmm. And so, so let me give you an example. Kaiser Permanente um, came up with a procedure recently that would reduce sepsis deaths dramatically. And sepsis is kind of a silent killer. It kills. It's up in the top three reasons for people to die, along with cancer and and stroke and heart disease. Oh wow! I but, didn't know that. Yeah, and most people don't. And so, so Kaiser Permanente developed a new procedure that would solve a lot of the problems with sepsis that we have, and it would, in fact, save 149,000 people a year. Now, again, that's a big number, but let's translate that in a way that would bring more motivation to the table. So if, if every hospital in the country adopted this new procedure, save 149,000 people a year, that's the equivalent of saving every woman with breast cancer and every man that's diagnosed with prostate cancer in a given year. And now, all of a sudden, that sepsis work seems really, really important Hmm. because we take two of the most actively resourced, socially motivated diseases in communities of people that have suffered from diseases, and and this is more important than either of those. Yeah. And and I think that puts things in a a broader perspective. Hmm. No, I like that a lot. And then, I mean, another, like, thing that was popping into mind is, uh, you know, around like engagement surveys that companies do every year. 
Yeah. And uh, sometimes I wonder how motivating is it to know that 90% of the people are engaged or 95% or what's the difference between 90 or 95%? Uh, and, you know, we do a lot of these types of surveys internally in our companies all the time around satisfaction, around engagement, around learning, around appreciation for our leaders. And it's always a number, but we never, at least I haven't seen any organizations really take a step back and go to that next step and say, what does that mean? And so I, I think it would also be very interesting to apply that in some of these other areas, right? So for example, like, you know, when you walk down the hall at your company, nine out of all the 10 employees that you see are in love with their jobs. Like that, mm -hmm. that's obviously much more meaningful than saying 90%. And um, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't think we do a very good job just in general of, of adding any kind of story or context or concreteness or answering that what if question, like in any aspect of work that we do. So it's, it seems yeah, like a, yeah. quite a big problem. Let's talk about the marketing equivalent of that. It's like marketing people collect all kinds of demographic and psychographic data about their customers. And so suppose that you, for a particular easy preparation food product, your, your typical customer is, is female, um, early 20s, early, early 30s with 1.5 kids. And sure, her top issues are, are nutrition and value. And so that's a bunch of demographics of a kind that you would plot onto a page and say, let's, let's make up improvement, our product for this customer. Mm -hmm. But imagine that you tried to, to form a living, breathing human being out of those statistics. And you said, you know, a typical customer is a mom, earth, earth 30 is mom coming home from work and grabbing her kids in preschool and she's got a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And the two-year-old, every time she picks up a box to look at the nutrition information, is slapping the, the box out of her hand. And the four-year-old's trying to rearrange the shelving, you know, across the aisle. <laughs> and and like we've all we've all been in that position. We've we've been parents of young kids, and just calling back some of those memories makes a big impact. And yet, what we've done is we've taken abstract psychographic and demographic information, and just breathe some life into it. And that yeah. makes a big difference. And I like that concept of, uh, you know, kind of another phrase, right? Breathe life into it. Uh, so I think whenever we're using any kind of data or information, whether you're a leader or not, is you need to ask yourself that question of how do you breathe life into that, into that number or that statistic? And, and, and what does that actually mean? Yeah. Uh, Cause that, that would probably one, be a very useful thing to do. One of the most profound tools that we talk about in the book, I think, is, is converting things into a process. And that's another way of breathing life into things. And so so at one point in the dot-com era, the, the venture capital community in Silicon Valley had raised $200 billion of venture capital. And that was a huge amount relative to venture capital that had gone on before. In fact, it was probably as much in that five-year period as it had been in the 25 years before in venture capital. And people were kind of thinking, you know, are we going to be able to hit traditional return rates for BC, which at the time was was 18% per year? Are we going to be able to do that with our 200 billion that we've just raised collectively? And it's not clear because if you do out the, the calculation, what that means is they would have to create $1.3 trillion in value over the next 10 years. And it sounds high, but you know, they had created Cisco, they had created eBay, they had created lots of companies that were very valuable. And and it was kind of possible to motivate yourself to believe, you know, maybe we could do it, until a Fortune magazine writer said, let's, let's think about this for a second. eBay was the big hit of the previous era, era of fundraising. And Benchmark Capital, which earned the most on eBay, earned $4 billion in their investment. That's not a bad day's work. But how many Ebays would it take between now and 10 years from now to equal 18% gains on $200 billion? And the answer was 365 or something like that. You know, so one, one, eBay, one eBay essentially every 10 days was the correct statistic until now and 10 years from now. Oh. And as soon as you say it like that, it's just it's just utterly impossible to believe that you're going to come up with one eBay every 10 days between now and then. I mean, the modern equivalent would be one Facebook every six weeks between now and 10 years from now. Yeah, that's crazy. And, and so so by breathing some life into the statistic, you, you understand – 
you're actually in a position not to only understand, but to, but to be convinced in your mind that this, this is not going to be possible. Yeah. And so it's not just translation of a number. It's actually helping you think about the number in a clearer way than you would have before. Where do you find, and I know this might sound like a weird question, um, but where do you find the stories to breathe life into something? Because I feel like sometimes that's one of the things that people struggle with is they have a piece of data, they have some information, and they don't know how to turn that into a story. Um, where, like, how do you begin? Like, if, if you're, let's say I'm a leader at a company, I'm about to give a presentation tomorrow, I have, you know, 20 different numbers I need to convey to people. And I want to figure out how to add the human to it, how to, you know, add soul and, and personality into those numbers. Where do I go? How do like, how do I begin searching for something that would, that would accomplish that? Yeah. I think my first piece of advice is, is just do something. And, and that was the lesson to me of the being results of, you know, five Oklahomas is not a great comparison. It's not the best you could probably do, but it's a comparison and it's going to help people, according to the Bing data, double the accuracy with which they, they recall and use that statistic later on. And so the first piece of advice is just draw a comparison somewhere. Find, find something else in a similar domain that has, has meaning. Compare things with, with rival industries, compare things with various groups of customers, you know, Whatever comparison you can put on the table is going to help people start thinking through numbers. And and the second thing I think I would do is once you've got comparisons on the table, think about whether they're whether they're motivational. And and there you want to you want to compare things to the best. And so, for example, um, well here's one from geography that you know from kid. Uh, what's the longest river in the world? What would be your answer? Denial. 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 <laughs> yeah. Denial yeah. is the longest. And what's the widest, heaviest volume river? Oh, man. I have no idea. Well, Jeff Bezos has corrupted our brains at this point, but it's the Amazon. Okay. And that's. I was going to say that, and I didn't want to sound stupid, but I guess saying I don't know is, <laughs> I should have just said that. No, I mean, it's, it's like I have the same problem. It's like, that, that, that resonates in my mind from a long time ago, but it seems corrupted now because we've got this other meaning of Amazon. But, but that's been the traditional. As we've always said yeah. the Nile is the longest, and the Amazon is the widest, the highest volume. And it turns out that's not right. And because I'd always thought of those as independently, they were standing head and shoulders above their their peers on on whatever dimension they were in, ahead on. But the Nile is only tenuously the longest river. In fact, some ways you measure it, the Amazon's longer than the Nile. But what is not at all a question is that the Amazon is the widest, heaviest volume river. In fact, of the top 11 rivers, four of the top 11 rivers flow into the Amazon before the Amazon ends. Hmm. And if you took the remaining seven of the top 11 and you combined them, so this is like the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, the, the Mississippi River, if you combined the other seven of the top 11, you still wouldn't equal the, the throughput of the, the Amazon. And, and so what, what I think is, is useful about that is, to, back to the person that's giving the presentation, putting numbers in perspective, you're just, you're just looking at the data and trying to add up and, and partial out what's, what's big and what's not big. And what immediately becomes clear there is we've misled generations of kids in science classes because the Nile is just barely longer. But the Amazon, people I have a sense of, is, is vastly, vastly bigger and, and bigger in a really consequential way. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's what, what the pres presenter ought to be looking for is there are lots of these numbers that are going to be about comparisons where this is almost equal to that. But there are going to be a few numbers that really drive the process, that really drive the, the business results. And if we understood those deep, deeply different numbers, I think we'd be in a better position to make good decisions for our group and our company going forward. Yeah, and I love that you said uh, any comparison is better than nothing. Because, uh, you know, even, even in your example of the Oklahomas, 
maybe not ideal, but anything is better than just saying 80% or 50% or three fourths. So as long as you you can add a little bit of context to it, even if it's not perfect, you can always refine that over time, but at least it gives people a visual or something to ground themselves to, to make that number a little bit more, uh, more real, so to speak. Exactly. Um, and what's your thought on, uh, using emotion in numbers? Like, do you find that, you know, if, if, if you're someone at a company and you want to convince somebody else to do something is hitting that emotional button, uh, an important factor. And do you have any suggestions on how to do that? I think it's a very important factor because we're, we're essentially divided up into a thinking part of our brains and a feeling part of our brains. And if we're just motivating the thinking part, it's very often to difficult to get ourselves geared up and motivated to, to make a change. And so in our book, then Dan, Dan I wrote a book on switch. We, we talked about those two sides of our brain and and I think business people, on average, are very comfortable with the, the cognitive understanding part of our brain and appealing to that. But we're a little more tenuous about how to deal with the emotion side. And and yet, I think the emotion side, change happens when, when we overcome the, the reticence and the, the lack of momentum and inertia that we have to overcome to, in order to, to do something differently. And there you need the Florence Nightingale tactic of really making people incensed by this notion that we're killing off 1,100 of our soldiers every year in our hospitals. And she had, she had a graph at one point that showed convincingly that of the soldiers that were dying in a given month in the Crimean War, there was a small number that were shot by the Russians, who were our enemies, and there were about eight times that number that were killed off by our own hospitals. And... When you show when you show comparisons like that, it it motivates people at a visceral level that this is wrong, this is not, this should not stand, this will not stand, and that's what she used to motivate the people back in at home in England when she returned. The generals, the doctors, the chief surgeons, the lords in the the parliament, they had to be motivated to tackle an issue. And the way she motivated them was to make the numbers emotional. Mm, yeah, I think that's that's great advice. Um, and like you said, I, I think a lot of times we do make decisions not just based on logic, but also based on emotion. So if you can kind of hit that emotion button, you're probably going to have some pretty good success with <laughs> trying to get some change to happen, whatever that change might be. Um, I know we only have a couple minutes left here. Um, so maybe we could wrap up with just the one or two final questions. Uh, one of them being for people who are looking to start to make some kind of change right away, as far as how they think about numbers and use numbers, are there any, dare I say, simply yet practical steps that we can take? Uh, I, I know you have a lot of examples in the book, but what are maybe some of the easiest, more immediate changes that people can start to do? I think the easiest change is to take one number in the presentation and and translate it. And don't worry about all the other ones. You know, so we eventually want to get to every number translated every time, but just start with one. And pick your most important, but then simplify that number so no no extra f- cranky six digit specificity around the number and talk about what that number means in general. And so so if you look at the, the revenue for example of video games, um there's about two hundred million dollars, well, two hundred billion dollars worldwide in the video game industry. There's about fifty billion dollars worldwide in the movie industry, and there's about twenty billion dollars in the music industry. Now, those numbers may or may not persuade you that video games is really important, but if you said video games are four times the size of Hollywood and 10 times the size of the music industry, all of a sudden you've got an aha moment. It's like, wow, we really need to understand video games. And it may, for an entrepreneur, it may evoke opportunities there. I mean, think of the award shows that we have for music and, and for movies. Is there an equivalent award show for video games? And and maybe it's that geeks don't look good on red carpets. I mean, that's a legitimate <laughs> hypothesis. But, but we ought to have 10 times the award shows for 
for for video games that we do for for music. Yeah. And if you get an Academy Award for Hollywood, we're gonna have three Academy Award shows for the video games industry for various categories. And and so taking that number and unpacking the meaning and using comparisons that people already are bought into, I think that's going to make your number stand more on its own. If you could say compared to everything that we know that is important. So if, yeah. if, you're, if you're the size of Hollywood, you're a significant industry. If you're four times the size of Hollywood, that's really impressive. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, and last question for you is going to be where people can go to learn more about you and grab your book. And if you have any last uh, parting words of wisdom or advice on numbers, <laughs> feel free to feel free to throw uh, something like that out there too. Well, feel free to log over to our website at heathbrothers.com. There's a section on, on the new book, Making Numbers Count. And, and I think my major piece of advice is, is you know, we value people who can, well, Superman could see through walls. And, and I think the capacity that you have, if you're, if you're numbers friendly and you actually do the, the work to turn your numbers into something that's emotional and understandable, you're helping other people see through walls. Yeah. And that's even better than a superpower. I love that. Wonderful piece of advice and a, a great way to wrap up. Uh, Chip, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to share your insights with me. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And thanks everyone for tuning in. My guest again has been Chip Heath. Make sure to grab his brand new book called Making Numbers Count, The Art and Science of Communicating Numbers, and I will see all of you next week. Thanks again for tuning in to today's episode. Please remember to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred channel is. I cannot express how important those reviews and ratings are to the success of this show, and they keep allowing me to bring back amazing guests. Lastly, don't forget to check out the brand new PDF that I just put out, which looks at the evolution of the employee. In other words, how employees are evolving and changing and what you as an organization should do to adapt. You'll get a complete breakdown of what that evolution looks like, as well as action items that you can and should be taking. That PDF is available at thefutureemployee.com. And if you want to reach out to me for whatever reason, whether it's inviting me to speak, sponsoring the show, or just giving me some feedback, you can always do so. My email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Again, that's jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Thanks again for tuning in and I will see you next time.